Let's take a closer look at the histology of cardiac muscle tissue. Um, remember, muscle tissue is contractile, so there are going to be some similarities with skeletal muscle that we've already looked at. I have a chunk of skeletal muscle here for you to look at just to remind yourself of the characteristics of skeletal muscle. You remember that skeletal muscles are very long tubular fibers. They're myofibers. The single muscle cell is this long tube. Uh, skeletal muscle is striated, hence the stripes that you see, and has multiple nuclei in it. Now, I'm going to get rid of this piece of skeletal muscle cell, and let's look at um, cardiac muscle tissue. And this is, again, it's histology, so of course you guys are going to start twitching, which I'm okay with that. Twitching is cool. And since I got rid of my pen, of course it's a giant pen now. First, look closely. Look closely. Do you see my striations? Do you see these striations right here? Yes. Those striations indicate that cardiac muscle tissue is striated. Why was skeletal muscle striated? I love thinking about all of you answering my questions out loud, even though maybe you're in a room by yourself too. Answer the question. Why was skeletal muscle striated? It was striated because it was made of the myofibrils that were stacked and arranged in sarcomeres. And we could see dark bands and light bands because of that arrangement. Guess what? Cardiac muscle has the exact same thing. In fact, cardiac muscle fibers, cells, are filled with myofibrils. What does that tell you about skeletal muscle? I mean cardiac muscle when compared to skeletal muscle. The mechanism of contraction, the actual contraction of the muscle itself is very similar to skeletal muscle contraction. So we're not actually going to spend time looking at how cardiac muscle contracts at the myofilament level. We're going to look a little bit farther up, like what stimulates. We're going to assume that contraction is facilitated by myosin and actin and the whole um, sliding filament process. The striations, if you're given um, a slide, cardiac muscle is striated. Look, look, look. Do you see these lines that you see in here? These lines are unique structures, unique to, these aren't striations. Do you see the difference? Here are my little striations, striations, but then you end up with these interesting lines. Like there's some, here's some. These things are called intercalated discs. Inter, not intertalated, intercalated, that's an A intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are these unique structures that connect two cardiac muscle cells to each other. At an intercalated disc, this would be one cardiac muscle cell. Here's an intercalated disc which means that this is another one. Here's another intercalated disc, which means this is another one. Here's another one, okay? Intercalated discs connect cardiac muscle cells end to end. Intercalated discs are made of structures like mm, rivets. Not, they're not rivets. They're like connectors. They're strong bolts, nuts and bolts, that connect the cardiac muscle cells to each other, and they're called desmosomes. Desmosomes connect cardiac muscle cells to each other in the intercalated disc. If you zoomed in and looked at one of these intercalated discs, you'd see all these bolts in there. Those are desmosomes. You'd also see something we've seen before. 
Intercalated disks are full of gap junctions. This is weird. What are gap junctions? Do you remember? The gap junctions, they're like channels. They're like, except they're not um, specific for only certain things. They're like big old channel proteins. They're like rivets, grommets. Not grommets. Not rivets. I don't even know what a rivet is. Grommets, like the things that are your hoodie strings go through in your sweatshirt. They create a tunnel between two cells. So intercalated disks contain desmosomes, bolts holding them together, and gap junctions, holes, connectors between the two. Look, I'm going to take a fresh intercalated disk right here, and I'm going to draw a desmosome and a gap junction. That's supposed to be a gap junction. It looks like a tunnel. That those two structures, both of them, are very significant functionally. They're structural characteristics of cardiac muscle tissue that enable the heart to keep beating 100,000 times every single day. Are you kidding me? That's unbelievable. These cells contract 100,000 times every day. And that means if they're contracting, they're pulling on each other 100,000 times every single day. Not every single year, every single day. Which means, I'm not going to do the math because if I get it wrong, I'll be really mad. Why would you have intercalated disks? in skeletal muscle tissue. Think on that and then remind me if I forget because I want to come back to that answer. But first I want to tell you another thing that is related to that answer. Look, I'm writing down why. Why have these things? Why? Come on. Here's another characteristic that's related. What did this cell just do? Dude, really? It branched. Cardiac muscle tissue branches. The cells branch. And they literally, okay, so here comes along a tubular cell, and then it branches and it has two connectors, not just one. It forms two connections with another cell at two intercalated disks. And they do that all over the place. They branch and connect all over the place. Why? Same reason that we would need desmosomes. Dude, it makes the cell, it makes the tissue stronger. If you've got freaking giant bolts holding your structures together, that's the desmosomes. And then you have these branches where we have more bolts and connectors holding everything together, we can contract 100,000 times because we're, we've got really nice connections. Can you imagine in a skeletal muscle, if the skeletal muscle has to do the same kind of contraction, it's not as strong. Can you visualize that? Makes perfect sense to me, but maybe you need to think about that some more. What else is unique about cardiac muscle tissue? Did you know that your heart started beating when you were 22 days old in your mama's belly? And it's been beating ever since. That was a really interesting thought that I just had, but I kept it in my own head. That was impressive. Here's another very interesting fact. Your heart, you're not going to believe this. Your heart does not require the nervous system to contract. Does that seem weird to you? No nervous input required. I hope that seems weird to you. Is nervous input required for skeletal muscle contraction? At the neuromuscular junction, we have to have acetylcholine bind to those nicotinic receptors on the skeletal muscle tissue in order to stimulate the action potential to open up the calcium channels and end up with a contraction. You have to have 
nervous input to get the contraction in the first place? Heart? Uh-huh. No. You do not need that, which is why I'm going to show you this. This fa uh, whoa. fabulous, that word was going to be fabulous. This fabulous video on YouTube of a turtle heart. This is a turtle heart that this young lad who went turtle hunting to make turtle dinner tonight, he's cleaning his turtle and the turtle heart is still beating. And it's only 30 seconds long, so let's watch it. Um, this isn't the craziest thing I've ever seen in my Craziest life. thing he's ever seen in his whole life. Still beats empty fire of his body. <laughs> totally true. I'm cleaning his turtle. Get out. I cut his head off like a half hour ago. He cut his head off a half hour ago. And I saw it was still beating inside there. So I cut it out. And uh, awesome. that was about three or four months ago. And this dang thing is still beating. <laughs> That's proof that turtles are very crazy. <laughs> okay, let's stop it before we get all of our other things that they tell us to go watch. That is proof that turtles are really crazy. It's, it's true, but you can do it. The next time you go fishing, I don't know if you're ever going to go turtle hunting. If you do ever go turtle hunting, cut out that turtle's heart. I mean, you're going to kill it anyway, so you might as well take out his heart and see how the heart keeps beating. You could put that heart on a rock. Like he, I feel like he tells us somewhere on here how long it kept, kept beating for 30 minutes after he took it out of the um, turtle. And actually, if he had kept it nice and cool and, and lubricated and wet and maybe even with a little bit of saline solution around it, um, similar to the extracellular fluid, he probably could have kept it going for longer than that. He probably just, you know, got bored with it. You can do this if you go fishing and catch a fish and clean that fish. Like, find its heart. Its heart, a fish heart is, like, really high up, like, behind its, you know, how you, well, anyway. Um, you might have to dig around for the, the heart, but you can totally get it still beating. Take it out. Get it wet. If it stops beating, you can actually do, like, little fishy CPR. I mean, is that really count as CPR? Not so much because you know, the heart is out of the body. But when you push on it, you apply some pressure. It actually will contract, like, into your fingers. It's really cool. So do it sometime. No brain required. Your heart, mammal hearts. It would be much harder to keep a mammal heart um, going if you took it out of the body, but that's just because... Um, our hearts are a little more fragile. If you maintained the proper environment, the proper temperature, the proper um, solutions surrounding it, you could totally keep your heart going, even though it's not in your body and even though it's not connected to any brain. This is very counterintuitive. Must skeletal muscles won't do this. Skeletal, now, twitches, um, rigor mortises. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that can happen after you die, but not a continual um, contraction. So the thing that we need to look at is how is that possible? How is it that the cardiac muscle tissue is able to generate a contraction? And hopefully you're thinking, well, it must produce an action potential in those cells. How is it able to continue contracting even without anybody telling it to contract. And that's what we're going to look at next. Let's do it. Next.